Greetings. Again, it's my privilege to share with you a message of hope and renewal because of what God has done for you through his son, Jesus Christ. And today we're going to continue our series in the letter to the Galatians that Paul wrote to those early Christians. And we're going to take a look at the latter part of chapter 4 of that particular book of the Bible. Before I do, if you do have your Bible, I'm going to just invite you to turn to chapter 5, verse 1, because that comes right on the heels of this text that we're going to look at. But it's a great summary. And if your Bible is like mine, depending on which translation you have, I'm using the NRSV. But chapter 5, verse 1 actually is the tail end of this passage, and it summarizes beautifully what Paul is writing about. And it says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So as I mentioned in the past, I'm going to treat this like a Bible study, or you know, kind of conduct this like a Bible study. And so this verse here is a great summary of what uh, the whole letter of Galatians is about, what Paul is trying to get across. And he's responding, as I've mentioned in the past, to these Judaizers, Jewish Christians, who taught that believing in Jesus is a good thing. And again, we can agree with that. We would agree with them on that. But they would say that it was not enough. They insisted that you have to believe in Jesus and you have to follow the requirements of the Mosaic Law. And Paul is saying, no, don't fall for that stuff. Grace is enough. You're free in Christ. That's all it takes. So what is he talking about? Most people think that freedom is being able to do whatever you want, that no one can judge you or hold you back. That would just be wrong for people to do that. Well, that's the world's definition of freedom. A theologian by the name of John MacArthur makes the point that with this kind of freedom, people are actually free just to select their particular sin. That's really what freedom in the world comes down to. And that's because humanity is not perfect and is by instinct sinful. That's what we, that we, what we all are as human beings. The freedom that the world seeks is a false freedom. It's a pipe dream. It's actually a form of slavery. Uh, I like to think of that for just an illustration of what this means or how to understand that. Think of the movie The Matrix and think of how people lived in a perceived reality until their eyes were opened and then they realized, wow, there's, there's something wrong with the world. But people, uh, to, to avoid trouble, they just would go along to get along. So those who live with uh, that understanding of freedom, that I should be free to do whatever I want, such people then look down their noses at the church, they look down their noses at the Bible, and they might even look down their, their noses at the Word of God and the commands of Scripture as being restrictive, restraining, condemning, and judgmental. So there's hostility toward the truth of God and toward true Christianity. The temptation for many Christians is to give in to this view of freedom by doing one or both of two things. One possibility is to focus on God's love. Uh, you, you can't go wrong there. The other thing that is often a temptation is to avoid anything that reminds us of our sinful nature. You know, either one of these tendencies would be a false kind of a uh, form of Christianity because it takes away our need for a savior. And no matter how much you try to avoid it, there's no denying the fact that no one is perfect and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinful to the core. We're born this way. It comes from the heart. It's who we are. Scripture uh, condemns all forms of sin, no matter who is doing it and no matter what the sin is. Uh, there's no degree of sin in the eyes of God. One sin is as much of a sin as any other. That's the law. And you break the law, there will be a price to pay. As times change and freedom is celebrated in new ways, more and more of the Bible becomes the enemy of that freedom in the eyes of the world. 
The reality is that these people are not free. They are in a, a form of slavery. They're in a slavery not just to their sin, but they're in slavery to the law in this sense. They're living in constant violation of the law of God for which there will be a sentence and a final judgment in hell. And that kind of language is not politically correct in today's world. And I'm hoping that you're still tuned in, that you're still listening, and that you're still engaged and wanting to get deeper into the Bible. Because then you will hear me when I say that there is hope, that God does not leave us to our own instincts, does not leave us to drown in our sin, that God has a plan of rescue, that we all have to do, uh, all we have to do is repent and believe in Jesus. And that's what Paul was saying. And that's the freedom that we have in the gospel. It's not about doing more and more to make up for what only God can do for us. No. To illustrate this contrast between our status under the law compared to our new freedom in Christ, Paul uses an illustration uh, of Hagar and Sarah from the Old Testament. Luther called it the illustration of the barren church. To understand this illustration, you have to know the story which is in the book of Genesis. So let's just think about this for a moment. I'm going to read here in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. Paul writes, Tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. So this is Paul's illustration that Abraham had these two sons, Ishmael by Hagar and Isaac by Sarah. They were both the true sons of Abraham with one difference, that Ishmael was born of the flesh, that is, without the command and promise of God. And here's how that came to, to pass. Back in chapter, uh, I should say, back in Genesis chapter 12, we could go back and, and look it up. But there God made a promise to make of Abraham a great nation. God promised that Abraham would have as many descendants as the stars. And Abraham believed this promise. Abraham believed God. Sarah, his wife, well, she went along with it for a while. Then in Genesis 16, we can read about how she basically said, you know, honey, I realize that God spoke to you, but let's be practical. You're 86, I'm 76, we still don't have any kids. This promise isn't going to happen the way we thought it would. So just take my slave girl, Hagar, as, as a surrogate, you go ahead and have relations with her so that I can have children through her. Now, do you see what's happening? Do you see what she's doing? Her hope had died out, and in her impatience, she thinks, you know what, time is running out. God did his part, now I have to do something. And she's not fully trusting God. She's short-circuiting faith. And here's the thing. Uh, and uh, I'm going to direct this at the men who are married because uh, you know that a marriage that lasts is dependent on you saying, yes, dear, and saying to your wife, you're always right. And you have to admit that, that your wife is always right for a long-lasting marriage. And that's simply what Abraham was doing. He was being the good husband. So he agreed to Sarah's plan. The result a boy named Ishmael, born without the promise of God. So, 12 years pass, things seem like, well, they had gotten into routine and that's just how things were. And then God reminded Abraham, remember that promise that I made to you? I'm still going to give you a child, a child of the promise. Now, the point here is that if you get impatient, start doubting God's word and promises, if you step in where God said he would do something, you'll have an Ishmael on your hands. Abraham, he was a great man. And yet this chosen man of God, this father of faith, this saint had a problem 
that God recorded as a lesson for each of us here today. He was impatient. Impatient, you say? Well, he waited how many years for God to keep his promise? It was at least 12 years between the time Abraham was given the promise and the time that he went into Hagar. Some of us think, well, I've been waiting 12 days, 12 weeks, 12 months, even longer. When will God fulfill his promise to me? Abraham waited 12 years before he said, you know, I better help God out. I better do my part, which turned out to be a disaster. Now, according to Luther, this next verse, verse 24, now this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. According to Luther, the two women represent the two testaments that Paul refers to here. The Old Testament being Mount Sinai, where God gave the Ten Commandments, which is symbolized by the slave woman, Hagar. So, Mount Sinai, represented by Hagar, symbolizes people born into slavery under the law, verses 25 and 26. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free, and she is our mother. So according to Luther, the phrase Jerusalem above refers to the organized church here on earth. When a believer accepts the heavenly gifts of the gospel, he or she receives a foretaste of heaven. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read Paul's words there, that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So the Jerusalem above, represented by Sarah, symbolizes the church as the bride of Christ bears free children who are not subject to the law. So verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, you child, childless one! You who bear no children, burst into song and shout, you who endure no pangs of birth, for the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. So this verse is especially moving because Sarah, symbolizing the free church, she seems barren, and the full message uh, of Scripture is not always appealing to everyone. And then recall also the temptation that even for Christians is to give in to the world's view of freedom by focusing on God's love and to avoid anything that reminds us of our sinful nature. And compared to the world's definition of freedom, the church seems to lack members. It doesn't look successful, again, by the world's standards. But by quoting this passage from Isaiah chapter 54, Paul is making the point that no matter how barren and forsaken, no matter how weak and desolate the church may seem, the church alone is really faithful before God. By and through the gospel, the church gives birth to an infinite number of children who are not slaves born like Ishmael, but are heirs of everlasting life, born of the promise, like Isaac. So then verse 28, Now you, my friends, are children of the promise like Isaac. Okay, Paul's point here is that anyone who has faith in Jesus is a child of the promise like Isaac. Verse 29, But just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. You see, the custom in Abraham's day was to throw a party to celebrate the day one's son was weaned. Thus, it was at Isaac's weaning party that Ishmael, his half-brother, began to taunt and tease him. That is what the law does to this day. It causes those who live by it to provoke and insult those who don't. It says things like, you're shallow, you're carnal, you're weak, you're immature. You know, that, those are the things that people who live by the law say to the others. You're immature. Uh, that they say to the people that don't live by the law. And we might even say to ourselves, you know, if I don't live by the law, then I'm, I'm not disciplined. 
I'm not chosen. And those are the things that the people who live by the law want to say, I'm disciplined, I'm chosen, I'm a spiritual Navy SEAL. And that's what legalists, you know, people who get into legalism, say to the child of the promise. And so there's a, this spiritual battle going on between people who live by the law and people who live by the promise. And Paul is trying to get us to live by the promise. Ishmael, the child of the law, the children of the law, will always persecute Isaac, the children of the gospel. So finally now, verses 30 and 31. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. So to understand this, we have to think back to Genesis. And now we think back to Genesis chapter 21, where Sarah kicked Hagar and Ishmael out of the household. That whole arrangement that she told Abraham, you know, to have a child through Hagar, it didn't work. This is the result. This is what was happening when it turned out to be a disaster. And according to Luther, the Holy Spirit calls the admirers of the law children of Hagar because they are slaves to sin, death, and the law. And to them, the Holy Spirit says, you're not fit to be heirs. Get out of this house. This is the sentence which God pronounces for Ishmael, the children of the law. Because they are slaves and persecutors of the children of the free woman, they will be cast out of the house of God forever. They have no inheritance with the children of the promise. And this sentence stands forever. And so we're to preach, what we're to do, what we are to do is to preach the law to those who are hard of heart. And once a person opens his heart, the law has done its job. So the, how does this live out? What can we learn from this? Well, the legacy of the Judaizers, the ones to whom Paul was addressing this letter uh, to help the people of that early church in Galatia respond to and how to live in response to them, their, leg their legacy, the legacy of the Judaizers, persists to this day, even within Christianity. There are denominations that still require, require you to believe in Jesus and do something to prove it in order to win your salvation. Even all of the other world religions are based on what we do. Straighten out your life, then God will accept you. And to all of that, Paul says, no, God has already accepted you. Grace alone is enough. That's all you need. God's grace through Christ. Well, another tendency that we see today of how that legacy of the Judaizers lives on even today is for people to minimize the role of grace. And it's, it's very subtle. For example, People often refer to Jews, Muslims, and Christians as all being children of Abraham, implying that they all have unity through Abraham because we can all trace our religious heritage to Abraham. Well, that's true. We can trace our religious heritage to Abraham, but others take it a step further and say that we all believe in the same God. Well, Words matter, and our beliefs and words shape our, our everyday life, the kind of world that we experience. And with that in mind, let's look at this example through the lens of Paul's illustration about Hagar and Sarah, which is this. If you don't believe in Jesus, you are an Ishmael, child of Hagar. And the only way to be an Isaac a child of the promise, is to believe in Jesus. It's that simple. It's all about faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.